Welcome to Revolutionary Gazette. I'm Will. Well, we're at Colonial Plantation outside of Philadelphia, and this is fantastic. Colonial Plantation is a member institution of ALFAM, one of our strategic partners in bringing you more excellent content about American history. I'm joined by board president and dedicated volunteer Chuck Barr today. Chuck, tell me where we're standing. We're standing in the kitchen garden and we actually believe this is where the kitchen garden was in the 1700s at the plantation. Great, uh, well, let me stop you. What is a kitchen garden? A kitchen garden is the garden that the family would use to raise vegetables for themselves throughout the year. The vegetables that are here would been, have been eaten right away, but also they used a lot of vegetables that would have been stored because in the wintertime, you didn't have the kitchen garden and obviously you didn't have your local grocery store to go to. So they concentrated on growing vegetables that could get them through the year till next spring. You mentioned that there's a special reason why this garden is here in relation to the house. What's that? Well, first of all, this is a great site for a farm. It faces to the south. The sun comes over uh, the sky like this. We're, at, we're in lowland, really bottomland near a creek. They knew that the topsoil was great here and it tilts a little bit toward the south so there's good drainage. It was a great place to put a kitchen garden. Well, I've seen multiple different gardens in my years across history and growing up on a farm. This one looks a little different than a lot that I've dealt with. I see wooden sections for the garden here. What is this? And talk to me about why this is. Well, we have raised beds here. And the reason you would have raised beds generally is to warm up the soil a little bit in the spring. You have to remember by springtime, their vegetable supply was scarce. So they wanted to get their vegetables in early. These raised beds with the warmer soil, they can get an earlier crop of vegetables in and get their food earlier. Fantastic. So we've got raised beds. Talk to me about what's in it here at Colonial Plantation. Well, as I said, there were vegetables, a lot of which that they would use and save for the winter. So we've got root crops. We've got beets, parsnips, carrots. We've got onions. There are also vegetables that they could eat fresh or dry, such as peas or beans, to use for soups through the winter. Uh, there are vegetables that they can pickle, uh, cucumbers, gherkins, peppers, those kind of things. So it's all about getting through the whole year uh, being able to eat vegetables. We also have salad crops and we even have hops, which was important in the uh, brewing of beer because they couldn't always trust their water supply. Well, Chuck, as we look to forge a connection with history in the Revolutionary War era, gardening can be a great way and vegetables. Talk to me about the specific vegetables we have here. Well, when we started, we uh, wanted to try to find heirloom vegetables that would have been grown in the era. So we grow some, for instance, beans that we believe were grown by Native Americans here and given to the settlers, to the Quaker settlers here, such as uh, India Hanna beans, beans that were named after areas like the Shakamaxon area of Philadelphia. We grew uh, purple Shakamaxon beans. We grew concessing beans, which is another area of Philadelphia where Native American tribes were, um, were living. And we also grow some squashes that have been here, we know, since the 1700s. Crookneck squashes. There's a Nanticoke Maycock squash that we grow, which the Nanticoke Indians uh, probably gave to or, or passed down through their, um, their uh, descendants. Uh, so there are a lot, of, a lot of 18th century crops. Some of those crops were extinct, so we got, we've got vegetables that are similar to them, like the Prince Albert pea, which is similar to an old, uh, old 18th century pea. Talk to me a little bit about the methods you use. I see a whole range of different things around the garden as far as structures and supports for the gardening. Yes. Uh, well, they use whatever they could find as far as supports. I mean, we obviously have some tall crops such as the peas and the beans. Uh, you see sticks that we got out of the forest. You also see some uh, sticks that are cut. And they were able to do that if they had a sawmill nearby. And we were pretty sure that they had a sawmill just a few miles from here where they, they could have gotten wood. Uh, but their trellises, their teepees, their um, longer poles, you'll see in back of me uh, something that's not a support, 
It's actually cheesecloth, and they use that at times as to disguise or to prevent animals from getting in to get some of their young seedlings. They're disguising peas that uh, would have been eaten to the ground by now by our groundhogs if, if they weren't protected. And what do you have further back? I see sticks as a fence behind there. Yeah, that's a wattle fence. They, again, would take, for instance, willow branches, and they would weave them in between sticks that they put in the ground, and you could make an effective fence just from materials that you might have. We actually got those from some wetlands that are just on the other side of the creek. So Chuck, talk with me about the end of the growing life. We've got the plants here. What happens as it's time to harvest? Well, it depends on what we're harvesting. Um, for instance, uh, some plants you're, you know you're going to have to save somehow. So the peas and the beans, a lot of them, if you're gonna dry them, you'll, you'll take them off of the plant, you'll dry them, and you'll save the seeds. Other plants, you may need to be saving through the whole winter. So you'll dig up, uh, for instance, cabbages. A lot of times they would save their cabbages by putting them underground, uh, outside. They would dig a hole, they would put in some straw, they would put in the cabbages, they would put some dirt on top of it. So a lot, there was a lot of work was done besides the actual gardening part in saving the vegetables to be eaten later on. You wouldn't go to Burpee to get your seeds back then. So they would have to save varieties of seeds that they wanted to grow the next year or borrow them from a neighbor. If they had a bad year, they could be in a lot of trouble uh, as far as next year for having seeds for the garden for next year if they had a crop failure. So besides the actual gardening and the weeding, there's a lot of work and preparation, saving seeds and saving the vegetables for next year and the winter so that they can make it through the winter. Do you save seeds here? Yes, we do. We save seeds because some of the things we grow, it's very, you, you just can't find seeds very easily. We save a lot of our bean seeds. We save a lot of our squash seeds, which are unusual varieties. Uh, you can get them some, you can actually get heirloom vegetables generally much easier now through some of the seed saving organizations. What else can you do with things that are grown in the garden here beyond eat it or save it to grow it next year? Well, actually the herb garden, is mostly a medicinal garden. Uh, that's what I call their, their medicine chest. Um, they had a lot of herbal remedies up there. They had things for poultices. They had things for cough, for headaches, even for mood. St. John's Ward is up there. They also had uh, dyeing herbs, which they would use to dye their clothes before you could get commercially available dyes, uh, such as indigo. So Chuck, talk with me a little bit about the tools of the trade of a gardener here. Well, the tools they use, they generally made. So they had to be hand forged. And for instance, they would make their own hose for weeding. This is a uh, hoeing hoe, a little bit narrower than a broad hoe. And this would have been forged. And this they would use for breaking up the soil and getting into some larger weeds. This is a Dutch hoe which is one of my favorite tools because this is for weeding. It only takes up the top half inch of soil, so you're not really digging up weed, weed seeds that are already there, but it's very fast for going through the bed and just clearing new weeds out. That's fantastic. So would you bring any of the tools from the field, the plow or anything into here? Or is this mostly manual labor here? No, because you, you, you really had to have space for an ox to work and that's significant. So you really would have to use all hand tools in a garden like this, which means that the women of the family and the children of the family did a lot of the work because the men were out there in the fields. Great. So division of labor to help make sure everything gets done. Right. Okay, what's the working season like here in the garden? Well, uh, it can go through much of the year, really. Uh, in the wintertime, they're fixing their tools, they're making new tools. In springtime, February maybe, depending on the year, but early March, you'd start planting. Um, you start with your uh, peas and your crops that would go in early, peas, cabbages, those kind of things. You'd plant through till May, and then your weeding starts. And then as the year goes on, you start harvesting. Fall, you're harvesting, and then you have to prepare the garden for next year. 
Uh, we would take the manure pile and we start distributing manure throughout the beds, um, repairing the beds, that sort of thing. In gardening today, there's a concept that some people use called successive planting. So you can have lettuce through the entire summer or something of that should you select. Is that something we see in this garden? Yes, we will. Um, in back of you, you'll actually see cabbage that is planted very early and you'll see cabbage that I planted probably about three weeks ago and I'll plant cabbage again. Same thing with salads. You'll plant throughout the year as much as you can. Uh, you may plant spring turnips and then you'll plant fall turnips, definitely. Great. Well, you do a lot of volunteering here and a lot of gardening. What's the best part of it for Chuck? I think the, the best thing is when you get a family in the garden and you get some kids in and, you know, they go to the store, store, they eat their vegetables, they come in bags, they don't know where they came from. So you can explain where your food comes from and the way it was grown back in the 18th century compared to the way it's grown now with large machines. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Chuck, and thanks for sharing the experience here at the Garden at Colonial Plantation. Thank you for being with us at Revolutionary Gazette. Gardening is a great way to find a connection to history. Historic sites are a great way to find a connection to history. At Colonial Plantation, you get both of them, and you might learn something that you can apply at home yourself. We'll see you again soon.